why don't you introduce yourself yeah. and we'll just go in. Want me to talk to the camera here? Hi, I'm John Glasser. I'm a senior vice president at Cerner. And John, you're so you're a former CIO of the year as well? I was the uh, CIO, uh, golly, back in 1994 at the Chief Information Officer at Brigham and Women's Hospital at the time. And now you're with uh, Cerner. Cerner. Right. Wow. It's, it's been a while you've been with Cerner. Well, I was the CIO at the Brigham and then Partners Healthcare uh, when they merged with the Mass General. And between the two, 22 years, and then left in 2010 to run the healthcare IT business for Siemens. And then we were acquired in, 80, uh, in 2015 by Cerner. So I've been with Cerner about four years at this point. Wow. So, um, so you know, just what, some of the questions we're asking people right. is, are there trends you're looking at right now, trends you're trying to keep an eye on that you're going to, I don't know, take a look at at the show this year? Well, there's these broad trends that continue year in and year out in the sort of broader landscape change in the payment system that is progressively moving to more value-based care. And that'll take decades to play through, but nonetheless it moves. And so every year it's kind of where is it, what are people trying, et cetera. So that's one. On the technical side, uh, I think the AI, sort of broadly speaking, intelligence and analytics continues to be, will be quite profound. You know, over time, and so we'll see kind of what progress we've made in last year. Engaging consumers remains important but challenging. And we'll look at that. Uh, plus, is the you've probably seen the federal government issued some of their interoperability rules this morning. I so think. I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion about those and the whole topic of interoperability. Yeah. So now we finally have a definition around what data blocking. Well, I, I haven't seen, and you will see, as will I, uh, these various uh, you know interpretations of this 700-page proposed rule. Right. Uh, and I think the best I can understand what it will be primarily is what blocking is not. Uh, and so from there on out, you begin to, you will field, if you're the federal government, complaints and through sort of case law, begin to do sort of refine that. Well, and there's seven exemptions. So it's like, here's the definition, yeah. here's the penalties, yeah. and here's seven exemptions. Yeah, so for, we'll see, we'll see. Um, and I'll be honest, I, I read it about an hour ago. So uh, I, Well, you've got an hour on me. I haven't, uh, I'll wait for the two-page uh, summary. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah. I read I read the uh, a couple of the articles on yeah. it, so it'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Social determinants, population health, uh, value-based care yeah. continue to be drivers. How, how is technology going to play? I mean, what what technologies do you think are going to play, and, and how will technology play in that? Well, I think there's a number of ways. If we take the area of population health, this is all right. If I need to take care of you and a group of people like you, I need to characterize you. I need to understand you, and I need to understand clinically what you're, what's going on. I also need to understand socially whether you're poor or not poor, et cetera. I need to understand your genetics. I need to understand a range of things. So we'll use the technology to gather the data to characterize you and to characterize me. And the point of characterization is to say, well, now I know the plan. Here's what I ought to do. And the plan's different depending on whether you've got means or you don't have means or diabetes or you don't. So that will, it will be a lot of collecting of data to help formulate strategies, and then a lot of the technology will be uh, follow well, are the strategies working. Plus, we have to introduce into the workflow both the patient and the clinician. Here's what should happen next. It's interesting because we, um, another one of those cases where the job is becoming less and less about technology and more and more about integrating with the business. Yeah. We're not even asking some of the, uh, this is what we heard in the last talk, we're not even asking some of those questions yet yeah. to build out a, a whole person profile, if you will. Yeah, I mean, we you know we talk to you know clinicians and say, all right, I'm happy, and I get the need to catch social determinants about food insecurity, okay? But what do you want me to do? You know, if someone says, I have a tough time finding, you know, getting a meal, or I live in a, you know, the only thing that's close to me is a convenience store. Yeah. Uh, and so it is, you know, we're having to work with, well, what do you do? Once that, so actually the technology part will be the easiest part. It's finding out there's food, food. it's now no what yeah. uh, will be the more challenging part. Well, I, I mean, technology plays a role. You know, we can we can Uber people around sure. and actually get them to yeah. where they need to get to. Uh, we can address loneliness, which we heard this morning yeah. is, is a major issue through uh, you know video visits and yeah. video chats and some yeah. technology. But the whole idea of hey, I live in a place without an air conditioner. I mean, is, is the health system supposed to uh, start buying air conditioners? Well, I think, you know, one of the uh, our, our clients we work with, they were encouraging all the elderly people to get out and do their 10,000 steps. And it wasn't happening. The question is why? Because the leash laws weren't enforced. They were afraid of the dogs. So, well, son of a gun, how do you fix that? And is that the job of the health system to fix the leash law? And a couple of, uh, about a year ago, I was talking to the guy who is the head of Medicaid for the state of Arizona. I said, what are the two largest social determinants? And he said, homelessness and incarceration. You, know, you come out of jail and you can't get a job. So if you're Banner or Dignity or any health system in Arizona, what do you want us to do about the incarceration problem? So we, as a society, and a health, have to sort through, what is it we expect out of all the various players? So um, uh, one of the interesting things in the last talk, she was 
describing data silos. Now, yeah. when we talk about data silos, typically we're talking, you know, our EHR data, yeah, right. uh, whatever. When she was talking about data silos, she was saying, "Hey, we need, uh, we need housing data, we need education data, right. we need all that, all those kinds of things." Are we going to start uh, creating? Re is that going to be part of our repositories? I think it's sort of what she was pointing to that if you really want to address the complete person. You know, you're going to have to start looking at all this stuff. And, and it's not just, and sometimes when we talk about, ref, you know, the interoperability of exchanging clinical data, but if I refer you to a place for food security, there's an interoperability loop, presumably. So there's a referral coming out and whether you took advantage of the impact. So I think it will cause us to look at a broader, more multifaceted, more complex meaning of interoperability and what we have to do and the collecting of data to go with that. So like a, like a homeless shelter, yeah. We would we would have a record of this person coming to a home right. or a food bank. I mean, that's part of the theory. So if you showed up next appointment, I'd be in a position to say, how come you didn't take advantage of the food pantry? You know, what's going on here? Do you need, do you need other help, et cetera? Is that the physician or is that going to be... I think, uh, you know, you're pointing all these things. To, I, you know, you, you can argue, probably appropriately so, that it's someone in the office who's pre-screening you and says, by the way, I know you're going to see Dr. Smith, but let's cover these kinds of things here. And if you're the practice person, he says, yeah, but that's an expense. You know, I've got to hire somebody to go off and do that. Uh, you know, who's covering all that? I, I remember back in 2010 when they showed me the plan for the health system. It's we're going to create this continuum of care, yeah. and I'm like, okay, well, our medical group data is still not talking to our acute right. data, and now you're adding in, you know, long-term acute. I mean, you know, just all these different uh, clinics and whatnot around the thing. And now what we're saying is that co that continuum of care is now expanded. Correct well beyond that you know our knowledge of what it takes to be healthy you know and we get into this stuff that says uh, are you lonely and what do you want me to do about you being lonely and a variety of things like that so it is not just the whether i can get food or feel safe at home it's just kind of am i part of a community am i engaged am i feeling valued so if you were cio today yeah. what would you be focusing in on well, I think, you know, and that's part of, I think, where we could have done a little bit more in the prior talk. <clears throat> you say, golly, it's overwhelming. Where do I even start? You want me to solve incarceration? How do I do that? Yeah. And I say, well, no, I don't think you got to do that. I think there are tools that allow you to do a social determinant assessment, a prepare tool is one of them. So why don't you start doing that uh, and gathering data about who's coming in, et cetera. And there are uh, companies that have resourcing in your community. Here's where you go for domestic violence help. Here's where you go for financial assistance. Here's how to get a ride to the practice. And I'd start putting those into the EHR, such as the tool says, we've got a food security issue, here's who to refer you to. Basic stuff. Uh, and not you know, worry right off the bat about how in the world am I going to connect to this silo or that silo, et cetera. We may need to do that, but you don't have to wait for that to get going on this stuff. Well, is it going into the EHR? I, we're going yeah. down a, yeah. a very specific, yeah. or, or is, there, is there a layer above that that you're bringing all this data into? Because there's, there's better interoperable yeah. platforms than an EHR. Well, I think it's one of the sort of broader challenges is in a lot of ways you say this is this population health layer that sits on top. Because we look at, for example, in our case, our average customer, a health system, has in their catchment area 16 different EHRs, you know, and they don't, they're not in full control, so they're going to have some interoperability issue. So by almost, as a matter of course, you will do this layer on top, brings it all in, cleans it up, associates you, you know, across multiple medical record numbers, and you can argue that's where it ought to go, et cetera. Now that being said, we need to get, if you're in front of your doctor, we want your doctor to be aware of certain things. So there's this, how do I fit it into the workflow? But it may very well be that the right uh, home for this is a pop health layer or extended HIE layer of some form. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, what are you gonna, what are you excited about at the conference? Oh, I think, you know, in some no, ways. Besides seeing your friends. Oh, yeah, well, I guess, you know, being having been in this injury for 100 years. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, in some ways I wish I were uh, 20 years younger. Uh, because it is a remarkable time in terms of the potency of the technology. So part of it is just to see where things are and what are people learning about, uh, you know, uses. You know, it's a classic Gartner curve, but a lot of the stuff's way up at the height. Yep. You say, well, let's cut through the, the noise uh, and see the reality of a lot of things. And that's always just kind of cool to see. It will be, uh, yes. it will be interesting. It's, it, I, I, I continue to say it's going to be, it's a great time to be in healthcare. Yeah, sure. And uh, it feels to me like the pace is increasing, but you've been, in, at this longer than I have. Is yeah. the pace increasing? Well, I think in a couple, yes, and in a couple of ways. One is the the um, business model shifts are occurring finally to the value-based care. So that's sort of picking up an urgency. The second is that the pace of technology is accelerating and accelerating in a more potent way. Uh, you know, if you look at, I remember, you know, if you take every decade and say there's a technology that occurred in that decade that changed the world. 
you say, well, what is that? Well, in the 70s, is the mini computer. 80s, it was the network personal computers. In the 90s, it was the web. In the 20s, it was the mobile device. And in this uh, decade, it's AI. And all those pick up, and they all gang up on each other. It's not right. like we're done with the web or done with mobile. And you say, golly, this sort of compounding effect. Uh, plus, you get these new entrants in here like Google and Amazon and everybody. And all of a sudden, people say, holy smokes, there's an urgency and an anxiety here. Uh, because they're very potent organizations that can move fast with vigor and effectively and will that change the game. So I think there's a, there's a pace change, there's an anxiety change that's different uh, and that's kind of remarkable. Yeah, and all the all the players that are getting in have different objectives. Yeah. I mean, Google's objective is very different than Amazon's, uh, Apple's and whatnot. They all, and they're all taking a piece. Yeah. CVS Aetna though, that's a little bit closer. Well, I have all. a, I teach this course in eHealth at Wharton, the second year MBAs. And so our course, our class in about a month, is we're going to look at the strategies of Google, Amazon, and uh, Apple and talk about, well, what do you think is going on here, your class? And do you think they'll be successful? And what's in their way of being successful? And it'll be interesting to see, you know, what, the, what these young, bright people uh, come up with. And it's, it's, not, it's not a foregone conclusion that they will be successful. Correct. Because they, they have failed in the past. You know, I mean, you're right. They, and you could, on one hand, say, well, they failed, they don't know nothing, they're going to get their no, fingers they're, burned, they're et cetera. Smarter. But they're smarter. Uh, they have more reason to be in here. The, it, the times are playing more to their strengths. So you can say, look, the mobility stuff is quite real. Everybody's real. So Apple's got a real strength here. Plus, you say, well, the data and the analytics is much more real now. So Google's got an asset to play with, right. et cetera. So I think there are needs in this industry which play much more to their strengths. They have greater reason to be here, et cetera. And they're hiring some good people. It's not like they're devoid of talent. My last question. Sure. Is there a technology that is going to help us to clean up the data? Right. So, yes. I mean, that, that seems to be, you know, to take advantage of machine learning and AI, uh, I, I heard yeah. Mayo's uh, Mayo presentation and they said, look, we're going to be in better position to take advantage of machine learning and AI because they did all the very difficult yeah. uh, work as they went to Epic to really clean yeah. up all the processes and whatnot. But most health systems have 16 EHRs yeah, yeah, yeah. and whatever. Is there a technology that's going to really help us or is that just going to be... There's yeah, a class, I and mean, I think the class of machine and pattern learning will do that. So the machine, you know, for example, in the healthy intent, which is the Cerner population health, and bring in data from lots of different sources, 95% uh, of the cleanup is, a, is done by the machine. This is, this is the pattern that's going on here. This, Mr. Smith is a diabetic. I know it's not on the problem list, but this is what's going on. And in a lot of ways, you borrow uh, technologies and insight from other industries. So if you look at uh, the intelligence and national security people, they look at patterns of data coming in and say, golly, there's an elevated terrorist threat here. Yeah. Uh, and they're looking at radio and TV and all kinds of stuff. So we're getting, as a uh, broadly speaking across multiple industries, much better at picking up patterns and say, this is what's going on with a pretty de reasonable degree of certainty. So that will, it doesn't solve everything and it doesn't mean there aren't kickouts or the machine will get it wrong from time to time, but it's, it's actually quite impressive what can yeah. be done. It's exciting. Yeah. John? Always a pleasure. Uh, Always a pleasure. And blessed, thank you for your uh, pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to hearing all the rest of these uh, interviews that you've gathered. It should be fun. I'm looking forward. Great. Thanks.